Sonny. Jack Sonny, how you doing, my brother? <laughs> my brother, Kenny <laughs> Lee. How you doing, man? Well, you demanded that I make this boot part. <laughs> I hadn't had any breakfast and I'd already done one interview earlier today and uh, I didn't have anything in my stomach, so I'm eating a muffin right now. Good. I mean, you know, what, what kind of muffin? Well, I make them myself. They're, they're almond flour. It's okay. Hang on one <laughs> second because I have to tell somebody who's sitting here. Give it to me again. Almond flour. Almond flour. Flax meal. Flax meal. Hemp heart. Hemp hearts. Blueberries. You know, some egg, vanilla, butter, you know. Egg, vanilla, butter. Coconut oil. Um, Coconut oil. And this batch I just did, I have macadamia nut and some sunflower seeds and other seeds. So I got to say, man, that may be the most Northern California thing I've ever fucking heard. No grain. <laughs> no grain. No, <laughs> no GMO wheat. None of that. No grain. grains. No GMO wheat. Jack Sonny, <laughs> thanks for coming on Play and Tell. If you don't want to play, that's okay. We could just tell. That's all right. Well, we'll, you know, we'll see how it goes, man. You know, I got the telly set up. You know, I can go. Um... Oh, look at you, man. <laughs> okay. So I got all that going. I dig the setup and the little heater fireplace going on in there. And it's like, yeah, dude, to... I got to work. I don't know. You know, I'm up in my apartment. I don't have my studio, but. You know, let me see. Can you see Jimmy down there? And oh, yeah. And Joni's down there, you oh, know, yeah. so. You can see our experiences behind the couch. I Perfect. can see it, yeah. While I was thinking about doing this, and I really appreciate you inviting me to do it, and you did the influences and inspirations thing on my radio, it was supposed to last an hour, and it went, I don't know, four or whatever. It's absolutely ludicrous what happened. It was so fun. Our relationship started off in kind of a, a different place. We you started know. out at the Quonset place in San Juan Capistrano. We were playing a gig there with Hang Dynasty. Right. And you had in on your Paisley telly. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't know who in the hell you were. And he says, oh, yeah, he's with Dire Straits. I'm like, really? And he said, and went up there, you started playing all this cool shit. And I was like, okay. And I don't even know how I ended up there. I know I sat in on a couple of tunes. I did Stop Breaking Down. I remember everybody looking over and kind of going, oh, rock and roll. It's possible. That might have been one of the little JBL things we were doing. Because if you recall, prior to you coming on with Harmon, we were selling all the Harmon family products, including the, the JBL array system. And right. I took my rhythm section out, which was called, I guess it was called Cold Cuts. Anyway, and it was my band with Marco Mendoza on bass. We had Eve Lukather on the other guitar. We had the tower horns. And we go to every town in America and we would just play a show and they would record it and they would mix it and they would monitor it and all the gear they sold where it was being used to train people while that was all going on this might have been one of those ending dates of that presentation i'm not sure i remember doing st louis yeah with snooki prior yes Do you yeah. remember that he had the sharpest shoes i had ever seen oh man <laughs> He was bad ass. <laughs> yeah, harmonica player. I forgot all about that. Was that the beginning of the Rivera Tang thing? It could have been. I mean, the Rivera thing was always cooking because it was talking about acquiring this amplifier company. And he kept telling me if I, he asked me if I wanted to be involved since we were involved in dividing the M series speakers. That's kind of what I was playing through and was selling those when I was on that tour. And so from those cabinets, which we were trying to get back to a warmer sound with a longer cone, with a paper cone on it rather than the metal one that they had. That's when he was talking about, you want to talk about warm, we're getting ready to get a tube amp company in the family here. And I'm like, okay, great. And right. so uh, that was on the back burner. And then I didn't hear anything for a while. And the reason why I didn't hear anything is because you got the job. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how that came about. Bouncing around the industry all these years, I'd been at Seymour Duncan. I was looking for cool stuff and came across Paul's. And I was using Paul's Fender Princeton 2s. You know, I was a fanatic for those amps. Used to use two of them and then got three of them and was doing a wet dry thing. And then it became a three setup Princeton with Electro Voice. And they were like, you know, 18 or 20 watts. They sounded so sweet, man. You talk about the E series Electro Voice? Yes. I put those in my Music Man amps and I just loved them. On the Straits Tour, I was using a Jim Kelly amp through Bandmaster size 212 cabinets. Wow. And I had EVL 12s put in because I read somewhere that Dwayne Allman and the brothers had like opened back their Marshall cabinets. I was like, I gotta try that. That was a great sound. Place Let's there. go back. You're a kid, you're in Hartford, Connecticut or wherever you're at and you're going to college. You're probably playing in a few bands. You go to New York, you start working at Rudy's. 
that right? Yeah. Okay, so is there anything you want to fill in between that and Rudy's started in the music business, even though you were going for a business degree at college? So here's what was going on. My family moved around a lot. I moved to Connecticut in my senior year of high school, and that was the third school in three years in three states. Okay. I I grew up in Western Pennsylvania, you know, coal mining country. Your mother's family was from California, Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Okay, that's wild. So in Connecticut, I started playing in a band. Um, I'd been playing guitar for a couple of years. Went to UConn to study literature. I wanted to be a writer. And the music thing was kind of like on this other parallel track and had big dreams. But I was seriously going to go through school. I'm, I'm going to get a degree. I'm going to get a doctorate in literature. And I'll teach in some private all-girls school in upstate New York. That's what I'm talking be, about. And be the volleyball coach. You know, that kind of shit. It was like... <laughs> I had a whole plan, man. It's like dirty dancing, but... (laughs) Yeah, kind (laughs) of. And halfway through my first year at University of Connecticut, I was like, you know, I'm playing music. I jumped and went to music school. I did two years at the Hartford Conservatory of Music. It was a jazz and pop program. And when I left that, I started playing in a local hotel circuit band. Top 40, you know. Right. Yeah, I mean, you learn, man. The first set is like straight out of the, you know, the fake book and you're doing bossa novas and you know all the sort of dinner set stuff i fought my guitar teacher in music school tooth and nail man jazz was not what i wanted to be learning i was Jimi hendrix freak i was you know jeff beck he kept saying oh joe beck and i'm like no i know who that is though yeah joe beck was a great player but i wanted to be able to bend notes (laughs) you know what i mean it's like I want vibrato in here, man. Exactly. (laughs) And like none of those cats that he was turning me on to or wanted to make me play like had any vibrato. I'm like, I don't, I don't understand that stuff. Right. So left music school, played in this band. It was called The Corporation, a keyboard player, kick and bass, female lead singer, drummer, and me. So you do the dinner set and then you did, you know, the top 40 stuff, tie you up with ribbon to all the way to Evil Ways would be the tune that I'd get to cut out. <laughs> I was like, woo! Don't forget Joy to the World. Oh, well, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, all the drunken insurance salesmen sitting in the bar at the hotel, you know. Um, Jeremiah was a bullfrog, you know that, don't you? I do. We just did this gig down here for the first time, but um, the joke was, if anybody comes up and asks me to play Rollin' on the River. Yeah, which is not called that. It's not called that, but that's the same. <laughs> People play Rollin' on the River. I always like, say that. They never say the name of the song. I know. It's <laughs> good. I know, Brown Eyed Girl. There's like a list. It's like, sure, this band takes requests, but Brown Eyed Girl, 500 bucks. Jeremiah was a bullfrog. Like Joe Jeremiah is a bullfrog, 1500 <laughs> Dire Straits. You can't afford it. <laughs> you know, the kind of thing. So right. the first keyboard player in this band was a cat named Michael Holmes. And Michael was this absolutely amazing keyboard player, amazing wow. musician. Had graduated from Eastman and had played in Chuck Mangione's band, along with two other cats who came out of Eastman at the same time, Tony Levin and Steve Gatt. Wow. So I'm playing with Michael. He's at Wesleyan studying ethnomusicology. African drumming. Anyhow, he's playing this this corporate gig with me. And he was like one of those guys, Kenny, that we could be playing a song and someone would come up from the bar, from the audience for a request. And he wouldn't know the song. And he would like point to his ear. And while we're playing a song, he would have them sing the melody and then turn to me and give me the, you know, the hand, the hand signals, right? For chords, up, down, minor, whatever. And we would do the tune. I mean, genius level playing. He would harmonize just based on the melody. Right. Exactly. Billy Peterson, the, our former bass player with Miller, he helped produce my jazz guitar album. And he's just that way, man. I mean, he puts those triads over it. Right. I studied reharmonization in school, and that was probably the most valuable class I had because it helped me find stuff in my rhythm playing, upper structure triads, upper structure chords to add on to stuff that would add a flavor to it that a lot of other players might not have. But anyhow, I'm in Connecticut. I'm playing in this corporate band. I'm frustrated. It's like, I got to go to New York or somewhere. And I wanted to study with Buzzy Feet. I love Buzzy. 
You know, and my only experience with Buzzy was Full Moon. I don't know if you know that album. It was sort of uh, Gene Dinwiddie and Neil Larson. I remember working with Neil. Yeah, I thought you'd know those guys. I remember that record, though. It was early on in this sort of little fusion thing, and I I've only found it, like, in Japanese. Were they playing in L.A., too? They were doing, like, a trio. They had the Larson Featon band at one that point. One. That's the one I'm thinking. I've never Right, which is a bit later. And Joey Brasler played with Buzzy a lot. So that was sort of the style. Buzzy played on, he did a tune called Jungle Walk on. I played it off for many years in a band I was in. Bro, play it. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it, man. And that is one of the funkiest, that lick and Can't You Hear Me Knocking are like two of my favorite greasy, crazy guitar licks that like, there's nothing like them. Yeah. And and Buzzy played this very funky jazz influence, but still had the rock and roll, you know, bluesy kind of feel. And I was like, that's the direction. Remember that riff that was in Jungle Walk? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The first time I heard that tune was just like, what? Yeah. Pops popped on bass. Andy Sutton singing background. It wasn't really the Rascals. It was just a studio band. Is that Isle of Real? I think that yeah. might be the name yeah. of the album. So I asked Michael, he actually asked me, you're here playing in Connecticut, what do you want to do? I said, well, you know, I'd like to go to New York. I'd like to study with somebody who could, you know, get me to the next level and all that. And he was like, all right, well, I'm, here's a couple of phone numbers. You call these cats and see who's around. <laughs> I look at the piece of paper. It's Tony Levin and Steve Gatt. Now, you know, this is 1975, I'm going to say. So, you know, Steely Dan is happening. Blow by Blow is happening. And I know the names of these two guys. I'm going, oh my, I'm going to call these guys? And he's like, call them, tell them that I sent you. So I get a hold of Tony Levin. You know, I'm just like, I can't believe I'm talking to this dude. And he says, if you're playing with Michael, why do you need lessons? <laughs> and oh. I, said, I said, well, I'm not Michael. <laughs> Number one. And I mentioned Buzzy and he said at that time, Buzzy was in Al-Anon. He was like trying to take care of some shit. He said, the only two guys that I know that are doing lessons right now that you might be interested in is one is Steve Kahn. And I wasn't really familiar with Steve. I kind of knew about him, but, and he said, and Elliot Randall. Yep. Can't do worse than that, man. Elliot Randall, like reeling the years, Elliot Randall. And he was like, yeah, he said, you know, he played on Mike's, Michael's demos and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah brother yeah i gotta tell you man one of the most fun nights i've ever had as a musician was that night in cabo playing with y'all and skunk was there and we yep. did that tune yep. and, and looking over at him and playing that harmony line with him was yep. like i was just like oh my god <laughs> this is the best but yeah so i call elliot and he says come on down sunday right at around noon so i take the bus down in manhattan and drag my les paul with me up from the bus station and go to his place on the upper west side between riverside and west end he's got like the killer doorman apartment right which yeah. i've never seen never been in in like a beef eater outfit or something you know? yeah exactly <laughs> so you know and i go up and knock on his door and comes to the door in a bathrobe he's just getting up Right. And it's like, you know, noon or one, right? Opens up the door to this apartment. And as I look out the big picture window, it's like the park and the river. And it's this, you know, high ceilings, old Manhattan pre-war building. And I'm looking around and I'm just going, whoa. And he says, there's the music room. Hang out. I'll be out in a minute. I go into the other room and it's his studio hang. And he's got all of his guitars, you know, amps and shit. And I'm just like, oh yeah, man, this is what I want, right? This is it. And he comes out and we played guitar for like five minutes each. Literally, he said play and I, you know, played some stuff. He handed me his strap. I was playing a Les Paul. I handed him Les Paul and he played it and he said, that's really nice. And he said, play this. And he handed me that strap of his, which is the all natural humbucker in the neck. It's a 63 that's been refinished. And I had been trying to play Strats, being a Hendrix freak. I had never understood how anybody could play one. They were all like late 60s, early 70s Strats just off the shelf. If you don't have a nice big neck, you know, they're kind of teensy and kind yeah, of... Yeah, and the, and the frets, and I was like, I don't get it. You know, you have to work really hard to get it to overdrive and break up and all that stuff. Yeah, and that will lead to the Schechter discussion. And Elliot hands me this Strat, and I start playing it. 
And I'm like, oh my God, all these little slidey sixth chord shit, all the Hendrix stuff that I'd been trying to do was just coming out. And I'm like, what the hell? He goes, well, bass frets, number one, days before the whole plethora of fret things that you could get. It's funny you mentioned the Schechter because at the same time when you were doing that, I was with Dave Schechter in an M1 shop and we were inventing parts and pickups and figuring out how we we're going to build guitars. At that point, we were doing parts. That that was going on while you were taking those lessons. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, lost my mind. It was like, oh, this is what I've been trying to figure out. And so Elliot hooked me up with the guy that did his work. I went immediately home. And I'll tell you about the lesson, because I think this is really important. And it really shaped my course. But I went home. I bought a 63 Strat for $275. Damn. <laughs> it was 1977, dude. You could go to 48th Street, go to We Buy Guitar and see literally dozens of them yeah. from the 50s to the pre-CBS 60s. And there was nothing over $475. I distinctly remember seeing a 55 Strat with a price tag of 475 on it. And you think, there's my retirement fund if I had been smart enough. It was My first Strat was a 63 to 63. Uh -huh. Transition had the spaghetti logo, but it was really a 64. But oh, cool. The spaghetti logo. It was weird. It was yeah. Like do you still have it? No, it got stolen. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, I, that pain. You know, we play guitar just for a little bit. And he asked me to play a couple of things, and he's checking some shit out. And it's like, okay, let's go into the living room. And he's got, like, the bitchin' stereo set up in the living room, and, like, you know, albums for yards. And he starts asking me questions. Do you know who Cornell Dupree is? And I was like, no. He's like, Okay. And he puts on King Curtis live at the Fillmore doing Memphis Soul Stew. And I'm listening to it. And when Cornell comes in and does his little intro, when he yep. gets called out, I'm like, whoa. That's kind of like Hendrix. That was it. I was like, oh, damn. That's where Hendrix got like all that little, little wing stuff. Yeah. And then Eric Gale, not Eric Gales, but Eric Gale, right. the guy artist, he was playing one of these and he was just playing on the front pickup as well on the telly and getting similar sound, small stone phase shifters or whatever the hell they were. Yeah. So my lesson with Elliot was that for like an entire afternoon, he just went through Manitas de Plata. He would like pour, pulling out all kinds of stuff. And I thought, you know, I had worked in record stores by that time. I was like deep into it. I thought I kind of knew something. Oh, all right. So you were already doing retail. Oh, yeah. In my senior year of high school, I was working in LaSalle Music in West Hartford, Connecticut. And it was a combination record store, music store, and they did lessons and all that. New York Dolls came out. It was like it had been unpacked earlier before I got there the day. And I walk in and I see it. I see the album. Right. And I'm like, I just go and grab it and take it to the counter and like, save this for me until you know i'll get it at the end of the day and the two guys the owner's son and another cat who worked there looked at each other and said yeah you owe me five bucks i told you he'd be the first guy to come in here and buy that record ah. <laughs> 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 so having that experience with elliot playing all this different stuff that i i didn't know i mean i didn't know i was listening to the other generation of players so like keith richards hendrix clapped into some extent i was a huge Dwayne allman freak and it took those guys it was like oh they're playing chuck berry tunes let me find out oh robert johnson you know it was like that was my gateway to go back and start listening to that stuff mm -hmm. and elliot was a big push in that direction to go and like suddenly i'm listening to nothing but Alan wolf and then working on my vibrato you know all that stuff you know jimmy was kind of in your thing in conversation with him yeah, I mean, I was telling him about how the only way I could get it would be on that pirate radio station that was coming from San Francisco, Howland and Muddy. And then my next door neighbor finally turned me on to Electric Mud. And I was like, what the hell is that? And when I'm listening to it, I'm going, oh, that's what the Yardbirds were listening to. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's amazing that it took the British guys to send that stuff all back to us. We're stupid here. We just throw shit away like we don't even think about it. Right. It's like why all the jazz cats moved to France, you know, and all that. And you were mentioning yeah. 1975 and that incredible year, 75, 76. That was the end of that golden era because right after that, that's when disco hit. And it was just like, oh, God, now we have to be on hold. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I got to tell you, man, I, as a cat who loves playing rhythm guitar, one of my earliest exposures to music, man, besides my parents listening to Frank and Dean and Harry James and all of that, the big band, Glenn Miller and all that stuff. Yep. was Motown. 
and you know, listening to AM radio in the days that we grew up, yeah. you heard you heard the Stones, you would hear the Beatles, you would hear Motown, you would hear some country. Right? Exactly. If you watched Ed Sullivan, you would see the Temptations or the Supremes yeah. or the Stones or the Love and Spoonful, or it was all there. Yeah. I love playing rhythm guitar. So Motown and then hearing Pete Townsend and Keith, obviously. Hendrix, there's just this whole soulful funk, even in the hard rock stuff. The Who started out as an R&B band. And Townsend has one of the greatest right hands in rock and roll rhythm block, you know? And that, I believe, comes from listening to that music and those players and realizing that this is it. Yeah. Right here, man. And his whole physical thing, like Keith's thing, it's putting their body in the beat in a way that, to me, it's almost impossible to duplicate what they do without that physicality. Correct. Because you become like a flywheel and you're in motion and the kinetic energy you're creating makes yeah. a metronome that's existing inside your body while it's happening in real time. You can be loose, but you can't get out of the groove because your body now is committed and yes. you have to follow. Absolutely. Described it perfectly. On the few lessons that I do, that is one of the things that I try to instill in guys that ask me about playing. It's like, you have to internalize that beat so that you feel it so automatically and it's embedded in your body that then you can start to swing or sway against it or yeah. upstroke it. You know, you listen to reggae, man. And it's like maybe impossible to not move to be able to play that. That's why yeah. females make such great guitar players and bass players because they're always dancing and they're in time and they're in the groove. You know, because there you go, baby. not afraid to be uh, physical. Well, you know me when it comes to playing. It's like, I'm not standing still. No, no, you were like me. <laughs> when I got in the Miller band, I was like a pogo stick. And he opened over there, hey. <laughs> yeah. You know, what, the straights gigs running around like a maniac and all that stuff. Do you know the British cartoon series Split Ends? Oh, I remember the title. They did a thing on straights. And they had Sting. They had puppets for Mark. They had Puff for Hillsley and the drummer. And the puppet they did for me would just go across the screen. Like this bouncing, bouncing in the background, just <laughs> woohoo! Left and the right hand sides of the stage, you were connecting like a needle and thread. I was watching a video of you the other day with the with the famous red trench coat or whatever the thing was, and Mark's up there stuck on the mic because he's got to sing, and you're allowed to be doing aerobics, right? Right. But it added a dimension of excitement, especially in a stadium when everything's so teeny on stage. Right. You're adding some kind of motion that at least people can kind of go. Like there's something going on. So yeah. I appreciated that. I thought that was very- Oh, thanks, man. It's funny because there's like two schools of that. Like when I see the comments sometimes on YouTube and all that, it's like, what's that asshole doing over there? It's like, it's, you know, it's just how I am. Let's transition right here. You're now you're in New York. You've taken your lessons. Oh, you know, yeah. And you go to Rudy's. Moved to New York, was there for a couple of years, you know, trying to work my way into the session scene and and realized early on that that was not me playing you know jingles and all that kind of stuff is just you were a live like, musician yeah exactly that's what I, I always just wanted to be in a band and play live records sure yeah but it was really about i'm a performer yeah at the, at, you know heart and soul i'm a performer i'm a rock and roll rhythm guitar player Jimmy Vivino ended his uh interview yesterday with uh i don't quote by an old gentleman who said you know jimmy we're not musicians, we're entertainers. True. Along the lines of that, there's a story that I will tell you that, you know, I'm in New York, hanging around. I worked at Disco Mat, a record store for a little bit. And then I ended up working on 48th Street at Alex Music, which was, you know, one of the biggies on the block between Manny's, Sam Ash, and Alex. They were the three, like, full line music stores. Sold everything. Right? I got a gig there working in the guitar department. And Rudy was working as a stock boy there. He had moved from Argentina where he had like one of the top kind of heavy metal trio bands. Yeah. His name was Rudy Pensa, is that right? Rudy Pensa, yeah. He's almost like in our world, like Madonna. There's like a one name thing for him. We got to be friends early on. He decided at one point that he was going to open his own store. He had started coming to New York and buying all kinds of gear on 48th Street and shipping it back to Argentina. And at one point he came up to me and this is, this ties the circle up pretty nicely, man. Yep. 
he comes up to me and he says, I'm going to open my own store. There's a space across the street, second floor. I'm going to get used guitars and I want you to come to work with me. I grabbed the guitar player magazine and I said, Rudy, if you're going to open up your own place, and I opened it up to a Schechter ad, I pointed to it and I said, brother, this is the direction. Nobody on this block does this stuff. Nobody does parts. <laughs> Rat from Boston by way of Lancaster and Palmdale living out in the desert, Mr. Dave Schechter. Go ahead. You know, you could get Mighty Might pickups or DeMarzio's, and I didn't like either one of them. And so I was like, yeah, man, you got to get parts. People come in here every day, every day, looking through the junk drawer that we had for like a tuning key or a pot or a knob or something. And I'm like, pick cards. I said, Rudy, you got to go this way, right? I mean, you could order them from the factory, but they'd be a fortune and it would take forever to get. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and they weren't the highest quality. And you guys were doing, you know, at Schechter, it was like, brass brass knurled knobs and you know cool things and, and it was the first drop-in pickup assemblies that i was there the day he brought it in the day that he brought it in the very first one i put it in my 63 strat that got stolen the picker was made out of phenolic yes oil-based phenolic by the time we started carrying it and i came back off the road that it didn't last long and i went to work for him but there were white metal ones uh, like enamel paint there were brass ones there were silver all with the sort of quarter pounder style pickguards by the way the salespeople were shell horlick and herschel blankenship <laughs> herschel blankenship there's a whole story there brother from fresno california he used to send me pictures and goes, this is, you know, this is what my bathroom looks like now. And it'd be like all this exotic wood. <laughs> he was a pirate. He was an absolute yeah, pirate. Man. I learned so much from selling the parts, understanding how the woods and all these different parts really combine to add up to what makes a guitar sound great. Yep. I learned so much. And ended up with Seymour Duncan pickups and Jim Kelly. You know, we were the prototype guitar boutique store. And then John Sir got hired and was doing repairs. And then he started putting guitars together. And man, yeah, that cat is a magician. You know, I know a couple of folks in, in that world that do great guitar work. Bruce Nelson worked for Tom Anderson for a long time. Tom was the guy I trained to take my place at Schechter. <laughs> when I was out with Diane and work with her and get in the studio. Oh, wow. I didn't know that part of it. Stick. <laughs> like levers and stuff. Oh, my God. Anyway. Yeah. And now, like, a CNC machine does it, like, in a minute, you know? So that was a great learning experience and working at Rudy's because it was just focused on guitar stuff. Were you playing gigs in town? I was playing gigs. I fell into the singer-songwriter scene in Greenwich Village at the time on Bleecker Street. The bitter end. Kenny's Castaway is kind of a hired gun. I'll tell you, man, playing live gigs in New York, rehearsals are like, I'll see you at 7.30, here are the charts. And you go to the gig, or maybe there aren't charts. And it's just like, sure, I'll go do that. And you cut the gig, you get through it. And it's like, I learned a whole bunch of shit that way. Now we transitioned from 1975 to about 1980. So... At that point, I had been playing on at Kenny's Castaways. It was kind of a regular hang. And Pat came up to me and said, look, I've been thinking about doing a jam session, and I would really love it if you ran it with your band. Every Monday night from midnight to 4 a.m., it'll be the Kenny's Castaways Midnight Jam. I did it for a year and a half, Kenny. And it became like the spot for Jeff Golub, Kenny Aronson, the Brecker Brothers, you know, Will Lee. Bernard Edwards, Joe Cocker showed up one night. It was the kind of thing that after a while built up. It was like, if you're in, if you're a musician and you're hanging out in Manhattan on Monday night, you're going to Kenny's. And you know, you want an education in being a band leader and reading a crowd and dealing with shit. That is the fastest, greatest way to do it. You got to get a book, you got to rehearse, you got to get everybody. And then it all starts over again the next week. One of the things that I learned from it was it's okay to make a mistake. You know, it's okay to have fun. It's okay not to take it too seriously. Those are great for the young viewers out there. That's really good. So you're at Rudy's, playing in a jam band, and who walks in one day right. to the store? Subscription people are <laughs> hey, a juicy story. Here you go. I'll give you the juice. All right, you ready? We're going downtown one night, 
happened to be in a, a guy's car. Like who has a car in Manhattan? But one of the guys in the band had a car. And Songs of Swing comes on the radio, right? We're all in the car. There's like Doug Lubon who wrote Treat Me Right. <laughs> Whatever he was doing. <laughs> yeah, man. So Doug Lubon who played bass with The Doors, he wrote Treat Me Right for Pat Benatar. He's in the band. There's like all these cats in the car. We're in this car. We're going downtown and Saltons comes on. And the guitar player, Warner Fritching, who replaced Jim McCarty in Cactus. Ah, oh, Cactus. We're going way, yeah, we're going way back. Oh. So, and he was a great player. The tune comes on and all the guys in the band go, this is what we should be doing. And I listen to it and I say, I quit. <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> you know, in 1977, I'm in New York and I'm listening to David Bowie. I'm listening to Peter Gabriel talking heads with Adrian Ballou. I mean, it's just like, I don't want to go play the blues again. And I heard it and I was like, okay, it's cool. Well, but I mean, it wasn't really the blues, but you were young and you were cocky and you kind of had yeah, your and absolutely. you them in a box and you stuck it off to the side. You know? Yeah. And so I was like, I I'm not interested in that. I'd buy the first album. Oh, so you bought the album. I bought the album because, you know, working in the guitar shop at that time, I felt that that was part of my thing. I had to know what was going on. You know, that shop really became like the hub of guitar playing, right. guitarists and guitar playing in New York. It was unusual. There was no doubt that this was something that you had to have a, a taste flavor for that. Like the first time you drink Campari, you go, I don't <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> um, Aperol spritz. I don't know, man. It's, but I bring the album in and I give it to Rudy. And I say, Rudy, you're going to love this album because he was like a pure Strat sound guy. And he liked clean sounds. Exactly. He liked, that was his thing. And I said, you're going to love this. Because he was like the original Robert Cray. You want to jump up on stage and go, let me just. <laughs> well, you got Richard Thompson. You got J.J. Kale. That's that school. It's not easy. It isn't easy. You can hear all the notes. <laughs> you can hear all the notes, and there's a little dependency on maybe some compression oh. that we don't usually use, but... <laughs> you know what that is? That's a Jim Messina sound. Log as a Messina, I had a good friend, dum, ba, dum, dum, with that big compression on there. But I think that's what influenced Mark, I think. I would agree. Hang on one second. I'm going to ask my producer if it's a possibility of another margarita happening here. Yeah, I'm getting high while you're doing all this talking, man. I've been drinking. <laughs> I got to get one of those. Okay, so I turn Rudy on to the album. He loses his mind. He just loves it. I could appreciate what was going on for sure. Was he playing through Blackface Fenders or Matchless or what was he playing through? He was playing through a music man. Oh, nice. Like yeah. The, yeah, the hybrid ones. Yeah. Yeah, that had solid state preamp and a tube. I, right. those. I had two of them. They sounded good, man. You could get some good stuff out of them. So one day, I come <laughs> back to the store. I'm there early. Rudy shows up, and he's, like, super excited. So me, so me. You won't believe who came to the store yesterday. I go, okay, who would I got to hang over? And like, what? Dira Stratus. Dira Stratus. And I'm like... What? Did a Stratus with the with the, the album and the the, the, the strat? I'm like, did a Stratus, <laughs> and he's like, cannot cannot blur, can cannot you know the mark? <laughs> cannot blur. Right. I said, Mark Knopfler, Dire Straits. Is that what you're trying to tell me? He's like, yes, yes, did a Stratus. <laughs> he came into the store. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. You know, and I'm like. I've dealt with every name guitar. I saw those Schecters, those yeah. tellies to Pete Townsend. I mean, I, I dealt with Thank like you. all yeah. kinds of guitar players, right? And studying with Elliot and knowing the, you know, the East Coast Steely Dan guys and all that shit was like, I'm not impressed. I know that's fucked up to say. All we had was David Jenkins and Pablo Cruz. Yeah. Thank you very much. I like that band. And I said, what did he want? He said, well, Bonnie Raitt told him about Schecter Guitars ah. out in L.A. And he was now in New York working on making movies at the power station. And so he came into the shop to check out Schecter Guitars. Wow. And he had looked at a couple of things, talked to Rudy, you know, and then Rudy said, he's coming back today. And I'm like, okay, great. I'll be over here in the corner, sipping coffee, nursing my hangover. <laughs> And Mark came in, 
hung out, we talked for a little bit, you know, and, and he actually did a little news interview in the shop. He's already a star. Well, here's the thing, man. In the States, Sultans of Swing, that first album did really well, right? The second album tanked in the States, disappeared. And he was working on the third album, which was going to have Romeo and Juliet and Espresso Love and Tunnel Love. So, you know, he came to the shop, was hanging out. He hung around for the most of the day. He was playing guitars. He ended up buying a, a red Schecter with a maple neck and a white pickguard. He used that on the album. Now, did you do the demo or did he just get that from Rudy? That was my gig, man. I was John the Baptist. Really cool story, Jack. I think the people out there listening to this are really going to love this. You sell selling the Schecter guitar. How much was the guitar? We were selling Schecters for 1200 bucks at that time. <gasps> yeah, especially in the days when you could buy a Strat for a seven or maybe something like that. But they were shit. You know, they were just terrible. They were awful. And what year is this, by the way? I'm going to say 80 or 81. I remember now because 82 is when Steve and I went out and bought a bunch of strats. They were called the strat. The strat. Yeah. Parts. And they're all dipped in polyurethane. Uh, weighed a ton. Oh, they're all full of water. Yeah, but you could put like a spigot on it, like drain it. You know, it's like it's like a radiator. Horrible. <laughs> hey, they did so many. So this it's is amazing that they're still alive. Hector had to come at that yes. time. Yes. So we're hanging out and I've got a hangover. He comes over to me at the end of the day. He hung out the whole day and he comes over to me at the end of the day and he goes, you look like you could use a drink. <laughs> and I'm like, sure, dude, let's go. And that was the beginning of our friendship that was based on drinking, listening to music, and arguing about music. So Mark and I spent a bunch of time together just hanging out as two guys. You know, his apartment, my apartment, my shitty apartment in Hell's Kitchen, his brownstone in the West Village. And we would play records and he would try to convince me that, you know, Springsteen was brilliant and I would, you know, argue about it. And then he, I would say, what about Miles Davis? And he would go, that's shit. And I would go, are you out of your mind? <laughs> yeah, it was just like, it was like that kind of stuff, man. Wow. You know, like, like we would sit around and, and play records for each other and argue or, you right. know, agree, whatever. That was, that was our relationship. And wow. there was never any talk about me joining being in dire straits, any of that stuff. I was working on my thing, writing tunes. And honestly, the way that I looked at our relationship, especially at that point, because he had kind of, you know, the second album was a bit of a slide down. And, and this is going to sound incredibly arrogant, but I also think that it's key to being young and having a goal and having a dream was I'm only one phone call away from where you are right now. We were two guys. I never looked at him as, you know. He could feel comfortable around you. And, you know, we were honest. When he told me about Springsteen, I was like, dude, you know, you got to be kidding me. I was one phone call away from having some AR guy in a record company hearing my demos with my band or coming to see us play somewhere because we were a kick ass rock and roll band and saying, here's your record deal. That was the basis of our relationship. It was not like this. You were peers. That's how I approached it. I met Steve. He needed material. I was a writer. I had the songs. He didn't. And I have to say that that aspect of our relationship over the years, I truly believe was how I ended up in the band. At the time he was working on stuff, he felt that he was isolated from the rest of the guys in the band, that it wasn't what it was. We had many conversations about bands and playing with friends and what we wanted to do. And he was like, just go to work at Rudy's, man. You know, I won the lottery. You know, it only happens, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that's easy for you to say because you won the lottery. And I've spent 10 years trying to do this. One day. And then I got a phone call December 10th, day after my birthday. Actually, I got a letter the day after my birthday from Fordham University accepting me into a literature program for people coming back to school. And I, it was a full ride scholarship. Because wow. I, I had decided about six months earlier after all this bullshit that I had been like banging my head against the wall and Bowie took my whole band, Carlos Dillo stuff and Billy Squire fired me. And like all these guys that had been in town far less than I did got gigs. And I was like, well, I guess it's not my fate. So I was going back to school to write. Wow. I got that letter on the 10th and I was like, tell Rudy, I'll work at the shop. I'm going to go to school. I'm done with this other shit. 
Two days after that, I get a phone call in the morning. It's like 8.30 in the morning in New York, and it's Mark, and, which is not that unusual because he would call me from all over the world just to like hang and chat and do whatever. I'm like, okay, hey, what's going on? He's down in Montserrat working on the album. They had three months of production rehearsals in London, and then we're down at Montserrat for three months at Air Studios already. And he calls me up and he says, what are you doing? I said, I'm about to get up and make coffee and go to work. You know? And he said, well, I had to make some changes down here. I'm like, oh, okay. And you know, we would talk about the band and his situation and my situation. It was like, like I said, two guys. And he says, I had to fire the other guitar player. And I'm like, oh man, that sucks. Cause he had been complaining. I'm like, yeah, that's a drag man, but you know, move on. And he's like, yeah. He said, so I'm wondering if you want to come and finish the album and do the tour. I swear to God, Kenny, that casually, that out of the blue. And I was like, I'm banging the, the phone on the floor going, crank call, crank call. And this is the thing that we can't teach young students and young musicians that are coming up because they don't understand the Las Vegas you know, slot machine part of this business right. is just unbelievably unpredictable that you just can't, because right. everybody always asks, they go, what's the secret? How do I get blah, 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 you know, it's just, no. this is it. No. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for that incredible interview with Jack Sawney from Dire Straits. Another amazing Rags for Riches story, not unsimilar to Greg Douglas, the last interview we did on Guitar Player with Steve Miller Band. It's just amazing. You just never know what's going to walk through the door, you know, especially if you're working in a music store, which, of course, I've done all my life on and off. Opportunities walk in all the time. You know, you just have to be there. You have to be prepared. Of course, you have to be practicing your instrument and know what you're doing and have your voice in shape and look good and have some clothes, you know. So when you go to the audition, you look fresh and you look like you're on your game and you got to bring it every time. So thanks a lot, Jack. That was great. And of course, Jack and I were buddies also in the manufacturing business, We, as we discussed. We also both worked for Guitar Center, which was very bizarre. <laughs> that being said, Jack, thanks a lot, brother, for joining us for this interview. We didn't get you to play guitar, but we'll have you back another time. You can show us some of your recipes because he's also an incredible chef. If you'd like to take lessons from me, you can go to my Fret Friends subscription website which is fretfrenz.com. You can see a sample lesson. There's also a 24-hour trial if you'd like to see what it's like. If you like this YouTube video, please like it and also click on subscribe. For now, thanks for tuning in to Fret Friends Play and Tell. This series will be going on throughout the summer until I start going back to work again with the Steve Miller Band. So until then, we'll see you on the next one. But thanks a lot. The next one's going to be Pete Anderson, producer guitarist extraordinaire with Dwight Yoakam. All right, well, thank you. We'll see you on the next one. And stay tuned, always. Mm -hmm.